I come from an incubator called Ecomeric Technologies that was founded by Jim Dielson, who is sort of one of the godfathers of wind, the wind industry in the US and has put together a collective um, a technology development center around marine renewable energy. So the technology I'm going to talk about today, Seawell, is reverse osmosis uh, water processing, which is, which is a load technology. It's not a generating technology, but it's, um, it's all part of the same idea of cr extracting renewable energy from the environment and then being able to use it efficiently kind of in the same environment. So this is, this is part of the idea with, uh, with Seawell. Seawell is a patented technology based on traditional reverse osmosis, and it's really all about how the reverse osmosis is deployed and the, and the way in which we've kind of reimagined uh, how water can be supplied to coastal communities like Santa Barbara. So first I'll talk about what the technology is. Secondly, the need for the technology, which is, of course, a pretty important part of why you do technology to begin with and then uh, the implementation plan and, and how we're going about it. <clears throat> so the first, the first point is, what is the specification for this device? And so these are, these are sort of the parameters that we were designing to when we started the process, that it be a portable system, that it be responsive to a drought crisis, uh, that it be ocean friendly, that it be energy efficient, and that it produce a reduced cost of water and that it be better than a boat. And the better than a boat part is they already have boats like this and you can get water delivered or, or a boat delivered to, a, to an area that may need it. But, but there's a lot of inefficiencies in doing it with a boat. And so that's, I, I answered that question for myself when I first started working with Jim Dielson and, um, and so therefore I'm deeply involved in, uh, in going forward with this idea. <clears throat> So this is to give you a sense about the whole system. It's the, the Seawell unit itself is, is indicated by number one. That's the, where the reverse osmosis happens. It's kind of the core of the system, but, but it's really dependent on being completely kind of thought through from one end to the other. And so this, this sort of puts that together for you. This, this number two is the, the connections to shore. So there's water being delivered to shore. There's also power being brought back from shore to power the, uh, the Seawell unit. Um, onshore, item three there is the water portal. The water portal I'll talk more about as we go along, but it's the, basically the interface point where the water is received onshore and also where power is being delivered back out from. Then four is grid-connected renewable energy. So we're not putting renewable energy out in the water for our first deployment of this. We're buying renewable energy off the grid because we're solving you know, sort of discrete problems one at a time, and the first one is to produce the water. Secondly, we'll be, we'll be integrating renewable, other renewable technologies in the water. So the fifth point is the municipal water system, which is kind of the, you know, where the water's delivered. <clears throat> and part of that is actually six, which is injection wells. The water basins underneath Goleta, for example, there's a big sense of water basin system. Water, Goleta's water basins, deeply um, uh, discharged right now, so it could use a, a huge infusion of water, and that's part of what we can do with this technology is just pump, pump water right into the, into the aquifer. So a little more details about each piece that I've just described. Seawell Boy is a floating vessel. It's a spar design. It's extremely seaworthy, and it's better than a boat because of the way it's configured. We have vertical arrangement of the of the reverse osmosis pressure vessels, and we have it's super efficient space-wise and service-wise, and it's and we can just leave it. We can put it out and then just leave it there. It's moored to the seafloor, so it's stationary. It has seawater intake and brine discharge integrated out there uh, as part of that vessel. It is, of course, has the reverse osmosis equipment. It's receiving water. Uh, it's receiving power from shore and sending water to shore. And if, if this particular designs we're working on will produce from between 950 and 3,800 acre feet of water per year, an acre foot being a, an acre of land with a foot of water on it is an acre foot. So it's quite a bit of water. This is the connection. Um, 
It's water and power, telecom cable, so it can be operated remotely. And it's roughly between a half a mile and two miles offshore. The water portal is kind of the, it's the receiving point and it's kind of the main onshore element to the system. It's water pipe lands there. Post-treatment occurs of the desalinated water to make it potable. Um, the electrical connection occurs there. As I said before, it's powered by renewable energy that we purchase from the grid. It's also compatible with our microgrid architecture so that this can be a hub of sort of power stability, not only for, for our system producing water, but it's also, it could be integrated in a larger scale to a community so that it, it's, a, it's kind of a, um, an excuse for a microgrid, let's say, a place that, that could be um, using some of the new technologies emerging um, for microgrid architectures. And then it's also part, sort of part of that thinking about uh, microgrid, we can use it as a battery. In other words, we can, we can store water instead of storing electricity, and we can take the system offline and use water from a tank, um, especially if we're trying to do time of use pricing of electric power and follow you know, demand response curves. We can store the water instead of trying to store the electricity. And the, probably the best part of all of this particular idea is that it's a very small footprint. So it doesn't take a lot of pricey uh, coastal real estate to, uh, to implement one of these things. And then last is just more about bringing the water into the system. Um, we can blend it with hard water. It's one of the great things about the desal plant here is that when it, when it blends with hard water that's coming from the mountains, it softens it and makes it more, uh, more user friendly. And then it's of course um, available to be injected. Okay, so now to talk a little bit about the, the need for new water. Uh, we, there's a lot of water consciousness in this area and I'm sure most of you have thought about water one time or another here. We think about it a lot and we think about it in the context of climate change because the models are predicting it's gonna get more severe in Southern California as climate change progresses. So, so it's one of those things that really requires some, some future thinking, not just did we get through the last one, but, but really what's gonna happen next. And so the other key point here is that we're in an area with lots of people. And Santa Barbara is a nice little isolated bubble, but just down the road is Los Angeles. And if you, if you look at all the coastal counties going down to Southern California, there's like 17 million people. So you think about a water crisis whereby the water sources of the West are drying up, Colorado, Colorado River is down, there's no snow in the Sierras. This is a really big issue with respect to trying to keep Los Angeles viable as well. So we're, we're trying to get kind of ahead of this curve. I, um, you know, I, I was thinking about giving this talk this, you know, at this moment when it rained last night and we're in 150% water year. So, you know, you'll have to sort of think past the moment right now, but, but it, is, it is a very serious uh, situation. The last drought was uh, you know, one of the driest periods in recorded history. So back to, you know, eight, uh, 1895 um, records, there's never been a more dry period than, than occurred in the recent drought. And during that drought, uh, there also, we saw what happens to the state water system, which has been traditionally kind of our, our backup water for here. And in 2014, state water allocations went down to 5%. So we really had very little margin. Um, we, had, we still had some water basin water that was being pumped out. There's still a little bit of you know, backup, but we were getting kind of on the edge of, of that as well. So you know, the question is, you know, what if this went on for two more years? I mean, we really didn't have the margin to be able to do that. So thinking about icebergs being towed down from Alaska, or, you know, there's just, it becomes much more of a drastic situation. The, the other point about climate change is the snowpack, which is 42% of the water storage in California is in the snowpack. Temperature rising means less storage in the snowpack. So this, is, this again goes back to state water and water in general is that it's gonna be harder to hold on to it in the mountains. The last point is referring to you know, now, no drought. You know, two years ago, there was a drought with the term that I've heard recently called weather whiplash, which is going between drought and, and, and then flood. And so the solutions for this have got to be flexible because we're not, we're not really looking at just building more canals as being the solution. It's got, to, it's got to address a more dynamic weather environment than we're actually used to seeing. 
So this is kind of a graphic of how water is used here. Santa Barbara is a nice uh, kind of case study in, in water use, I think. We, we get our primary source of water from ground and surface water. Uh, we have reservoirs, um, and we also have water basins. So all the water districts have you know, aquifer, water storage underneath them to some extent. Um, state water is, the, is sort of the second line of defense, which was built back in the 1960s. It's 400 miles to get water from the Sierras to here. So it's a pretty long haul for water, but the infrastructure is there. And then uh, recycled wastewater is something that's been used for landscape watering for quite a while, the purple pipe water, as they call it. But it's also now legal, or it's becoming legal, uh, to use it for direct potable supply. So, so ultimately, recycled wastewater will and can be and will be injected directly into water supply systems. Um, and then finally, desalinated water, Charles Meyer plant, which is the plant downtown. That's, that's really kind of the, in some respects, Santa Barbara has heaved a sigh of relief because of that plant and that it's the one that has no, there's no drought uh, constriction on it at all. So, but then thinking about what happens, or what's the progression of drought um, as, as you look at these different sources that we have. So local surf and water, surface and groundwater goes away. That's, that's obvious. Over time, the reservoirs dry up, and we find ourselves in a, in a uh, locally very dry condition. Second thing is, during that, conservation's enacted, and we've been doing, we're very used to conservation here, but we've we've hit a level called extraordinary conservation. So can we get more conservation out of the system? And, and my thought is maybe a little more, but we're kind of squeezing the turnip here and there's just not a lot left to get from conservation and, then, and, and be able to maintain lifestyles. I mean, if we can all get much more conservative ultimately, but I think we don't really want to get to a point of desperation about water. Then uh, state water goes away and the main sources of water that come this direction through the canals and from Lake Kachuma, all that water then is gone, which is, which of course is a bad situation. Um, and then the recycled water also goes away because one of the things that, there's a lot of emphasis on recycled water right now, but it requires feed water. <laughs> so there's a point where recycled water goes away because there isn't enough coming into the system. And in fact, in Carmel, they had this problem in 2016 during the drought where they had to shut down the recycling program because they didn't have enough water to extract from the wastewater system. So, of course, my final point, desalination, the only reliable source is, is, is some kind of a desalination plant, which, uh, which I will describe further here. The, so before, I guess before I get to that, the, the existing challenges with the system that we have is state water is is also, not only is it snowpack constrained, but there's, there's some problems at the front end in the, uh, the Sacramento Delta, which, which is where all this water gets drawn into the system. It's having some bad environmental impacts on the Delta. It's causing brine from the sea to be um, uh, intruding into the, into the aquifer because of all the water that's being pumped out. And so the tunnels project has been proposed to solve all these problems. But it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar tunneling project, even if it's only one tunnel, which is apparently the latest proposal. And it won't be complete until 2035. So, there's, so it's not like we can relax and feel like we've, we're covered now here in Southern California, because in fact, um, it's gonna be a while. And it doesn't bring any more water, it just improves the efficiency of that system. Um, water reuse is a great idea, improving efficiency of water use. But the problem is that Sanitary districts and water districts have been, by, by design, separate entities that have separate priorities. And so the problem of bringing them together to do reuse projects is you have to break down these, these barriers that were, that were in place to try to keep them separate. So there's, those, that's being done, but it's just a lengthy process to get, to get all those priorities lined up so you can have an efficient reuse system. So now I'm gonna talk about the implement, implementation plan, which, you know, the first point is we would rather not be doing it at all. I mean, that we'd, we'd rather just deal with the burning carbon problem, not burn it anymore, get the, environment, the hydrologic cycle back in balance so that it's within boundaries that we can deal with. And, but unfortunately, we seem to be moving past the point of 
no, no impact. I mean, we are creating now visible impact. Um, the jet stream's moving. There's all sorts of um, new uncertainty in terms of weather patterns. And so we have to start getting ready for unprecedented hydrologic outcomes. And that's, that's the kind of the key driver for us in thinking about this. So what's the least impactful, most economic means um, to approach um, you know, this drought scenario that we're, that we're dealing with? <clears throat> so we've been thinking about it as an emergency response akin to fire deployment. So we have equipment, um, delivery infrastructure, and the ability to deploy we needed. So we, you know, we've got a water portal and, a, and subsea piping and a, and a buoy, which, which all look a lot like fire equipment in some respects. The idea of having these as distributed elements is to, is to be efficient with the use of them as well. So I'll describe a little bit more on the next slide. But we, we'll have, the, the, the plan is we'll have sea well buoys in dry dock waiting to be called upon. And they may be called upon in California, or it may be South Africa, or it may be anywhere in the world. But it's an efficient use of that as a, as a device that's sitting ready to be used. The water portal itself is not part of the Seawell LLC company. It has its own entity that we call the Water Portal Project, which is a nonprofit. And the idea is to build public infrastructure. And so that we'll be seeking state and private grant support to, to bring water portals um, online. And we will also try to work with state permitting agencies to develop a programmatic um, environmental and permitting process that allows us to cookie cutter that from site to site and not have to start from scratch every time we have to get a permit because that's California, it's a very daunting thing to get a permit in the ocean. Um, we'll also be working with water districts and partnering with them because this will be their infrastructure uh, once it's in place. The, the key point here is water is the cost and the, the cost of a water portal is gonna be less than 5% uh, of a desal plant. So this is, this is putting the you know, putting the fire hydrant in place, but not putting a fire truck on every corner. We, have just, we just put this infrastructure in place so that it's there and available as communities need it. Some of the environmental challenges for trying to get this type of technology permitted is the seawater intake is, um, the big concern is entrainment of sea life. So that's the problem. The solution is um, from our kind of without going into details, it's basically to increase the area of the intake so that the velocities of the water that's coming in is very, very low. So there's very little, um, uh, pro you know, that, that sea life is not gonna, anything that can move is gonna move away from the intake. It's more like a beach intake or a subsea intake that, that just percolates in as opposed to being drawing in volumes of water and then, you know, having that impact on sea life. The outfall is another part of this. What happens when we produce desalinated water is we produce brine at the same time, and the brine is twice as salty as seawater. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not innately toxic, but, it, but at that concentration, most fish don't want to, you know, can't live in it, so you have to diffuse it as fast as you can. And so we have, we're high in the water column. Uh, we have, we're not, we're, we're designing this to be to avoid being a point source in the water column so it's going to be diffused laterally and it also descends because brine is heavier than seawater and so there's an innate kind of um, diffusion that happens as it's settling down through the water column but we're still in the process of designing what that diffuser looks like so we brought in a, um, a team of crack UCSB engineering students to help us think about the problem of brine movement within seawater and to, to fundamentally get the mechanics of brine movement and diffusion so that when we, as we design the diffuser, we're really completely clear on the mechanics and we can actually then create a model. And, and these guys have created a COMSOL model that will essentially replicate the, the natural behavior of, of brine in, in seawater. So what these guys have done is they've done some tank testing and this is a, this is a picture of a vertical tank with a droplet of water in it that has essentially from the side it looks like a line the top it's a donut shape that's what the droplet naturally forms as it's descending as it turns into a donut and then 
it starts to diffuse as it descends further. And before it gets to the bottom, it's, it's now diffused to be within an acceptable level of salinity that, that is considered non-toxic. Non so, so even without introducing currents or other forms of mixing, just the most passive possible way of doing this, it, it looks like the gravitational aspect is going to have a huge beneficial impact on, on diffusing. OK, so energy efficiency, need to talk about that. Obviously, um, here at the Institute, we, we can't avoid um, a few comments about energy efficiency. So desalina desalination with reverse osmosis has traditionally been an energy intensive process. And we know that going in. We don't, we don't like that aspect of what we're doing. But it is an opportunity also for improvements. And so one of the things that's happened in the past 10 or 15 years was the advent of pressure recovery devices that take the brine stream and, and basically extract the pressure from the brine stream and recycle that as pressure on the intake side so that it's actually improved the energy efficiency by 40%. So we're talking about high pressure, 1,000 PSI input to the pressure vessels, and part of that pressure then gets recycled so that the pumps are relieved and there's, there's, much, um, you know, there's a big improvement in efficiency. So that was a big breakthrough. Um, part of the efficiency of our system is that we're only pumping half the volume of water to shore. We do the processing out in the ocean, and then we pump just the permeate, which is the, the desalinated water, to shore. And we also don't have to pump brine back out from shore back out into the ocean. So it's all done locally, so we don't have a lot of water movement that we have to pay for uh, with energy. And, and then I guess the, the third point there was that we're we're also going to make this a demand response friendly system so that, so that we can curtail the operation of the system as needed um, and, be, and be a demand resource entity as far as the utility is concerned so that it's, it's really a, you know, a friendly load um, in, in all respects. In the future, there are, there's a company we've been working with that's on the road to developing a new reverse osmosis filter. This, is, this filter once it's done, and it's going to be a few years out, but they've, they've demonstrated in the lab now, it's going to take the 1,000 PSI pressure requirement down to something like 10 PSI. So it's going to completely change the energy uh, use requirement. There's still going to be a need for pumping and for pre-filtration, and there's fouling issues. There's lots of things that have to be figured out. But, but the possibility of taking the 1,000 PSI down to, you know, even to 500 or 100 PSI seems very doable if not even down to 10 PSI. So there's, there's, that's coming, and our architecture is very uh, amenable to adapting to that, that type of new technology. So from the energy supply standpoint, initially we're going to be buying it from the grid, renewable energy, and then ultimately we're going to take some of the other companies in Ecomerit, which are developing wave technology, uh, ocean current technology, uh, tidal technology, and um, offshore wind is another one. So we're going to we're going to be integrating those sources directly into seawells so that instead of delivering electricity to shore, in some cases, we may just be delivering water to shore. Some of the advantages of this kind of architecture is there's no dedicated desal plant sitting on the shore idle, which is the problem. Like right now, Charles Meyer is sitting there. It's great. I got a thing flyer from the city of Santa Barbara saying, Right, we're using Charles Meyer plant to inject into our water basins, which need to be recharged. So they're using it. But my water bill has not gone down because we are paying for that plant. And the idea with Seawell is that we don't want to have this huge capital expense that is stranded essentially when there's, you know, when there's water. So we're, we're now, um, uh, I think we're going to address one of the bigger problems with desal, which is cost. The other, the other part of this is that we're going to build these things in a factory. And so we're not having big construction projects. People come out and have to build, um, in a, a traditional way, a very expensive plant. We're going to do high, you know, mass production, high efficiency assembly in a plant that's then portable and dispatchable. And the, the design that we've done so far is the cost looks like it's going to be a fraction of what Charles Meyer costs for similar volumes of water. So, we're pretty excited about the success we're having on the cost side, and I think that's going to be a tremendous benefit as well. Um, also, the distributed model is we're going to pump the water locally. We don't have to 
put it in a long system to pump it hundreds of miles. We can just move the desal unit to the, the city along the coast where it's needed and, and save energy and money in, in that respect as well. We also can then preserve water that's coming out of the mountains for agriculture and inland uses because we're offsetting that need by, by bringing water uh, to shore for coastal communities. And then final point there is it's, um, it's quick. We can do it in, you know, we can install in a matter of weeks. To build a dedicated plant is a, is a really a multi-year kind of process with, with permitting and all the planning that has to happen to get a plant built. Okay, so finally, the path forward for us is to deploy a pilot unit here, somewhere up and down the coast, and sell the water to somebody. And to be able to sell the water at a price that's that lower than what people are paying now. And we did a little study here at UCSB, and we determined that we could save the university roughly a million dollars a year by selling them water from offshore here rather than them buying it from Goleta Water District. So we we've actually posed that idea to the powers that be here, and uh, no one's taken us up on it yet, but it's, but it's real money. I mean, it's a, it's a very um, sort of straightforward calculation, simply, it's just a cheaper way to produce water. So, so that's another thing, aside from emergency response, we think we've actually got cheaper water. And then the next step is to deploy five water portals in water districts along the coast here to get that infrastructure in place. So we partner with water districts. We look for sites that are previously disturbed, so these are not you know, virgin beachside sites, but they're like oil uh, landing ports or places that have been disturbed by sanitary district outfalls. So we kind of piggyback on, on previously disturbed areas. Um, we, we then can augment um, the development of reuse, these reuse projects that are going on that are all going to be on sanitary district sites, that if, that, if, if those connections are being made to the main water system, we can bring water to shore and, and essentially add to what water recycling would produce at these reuse plants. And finally, the budget for each of these water portals is on the order of you know, two to four million dollars as opposed to 71 million dollars. And that we can probably get grant funding from the Department of Water Resources to cover that in partnership with water districts. Okay, so last slide, um, time for action. So there's limited water both in groundwater locally, also the state water is not a sure bet as we found in the last drought. We have abundant sites where we can land um, water to shore here and locate water portals. It's economic. Um, it's a great way to approach being ready for a drought without having to spend excessive uh, money on infrastructure that might not be used. And it will protect property values. It's going you know, it's, it's to be a fundamentally um, reinforcing aspect of the economy here. And the urgency, of course, is you know, deepening drought. And so we're, we're, we're very, um, you know, part of the problem is when it rains, people don't pay attention. But, but it is something that, that I think more people understand this is a long-term problem and we really have to get our arms around it. So, um, so that's it. Thank you.